Listen, I have to go. I can't explain right now, but will you call me tomorrow? Of course, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. All right. All right. Hello, listening people. Hello. Hello, Mr. Partek. How are you? Good, Master Ryan. How are you? I, I'm, I'm, I'm... Why I'm, laughing? I'm, 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 I'm feeling fun, knee. Fun. My knee is fun. No, I'm all right overall. It's getting to the warmer time of year, so sitting in the room recording is... Uh, Thanks for the water, by the way. No problem. Thank you. Taking it. (laughs) (laughs) Did did he get you water? Did you guys do a water exchange? Yeah, we did a water exchange, Mr. Guest. So, Bartek, we're doing our show Pictures Pow Wow, where we talk about a movie that comes recommended. And our cycle, how does it usually go? What is the order of things? So, in the first of three weeks, it's a three week cycle, I recommend a film. This week isn't one of them. Then in the next one, Brian recommends a film. This week isn't one of them, so, you know, process of elimination. Then in the third week, the listening people recommend it. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Yep. And we are in a listening people week right now. So we have a film that was not recommended by Master Ryan or Mr. Bartek. No, we have someone else to blame. Somebody else to interrogate about why they chose the film. And we actually have them here. We physically brought them into the room. No, We're we shining no, a no, spotlight we... on them like an old detective. <laughs> we movie. mentioned the water exchange and then he just appeared. Bartek, both of us do the wrong thing and we both be like good cop at him. And, <laughs> and we both forget to no, We all forget to well, do bad cop. You did give him water, right? And, and we just kindly wring our hands going, please, please, Sam, why did you choose Charlie's Angels out of all the movies in the world you could pick? Uh, no, we're joined by our good friend, Sam Noonan. Ahoy, ahoy. A doctor, we got Master Bartek, sorry, Mr. Bartek, Master, Ryan, and we can call me Doctor. I'll take that title. Okay, Doc. That's what we're missing. Do you have a doctorate? Not yet. Not yet, and, but and you, not you, ever. Oh, I was going to ask. ask. Are you, are Doctor you gonna begins with a D, not an M. You sure don't want to be Mademoiselle? <laughs> <laughs> What's a Polish word for Mister? Um, pan. Yeah, that, that also doesn't. What start about well. Pan Sam? <laughs> You know what? You know what? I like that. We're going to keep that because we're spin Polish because we're spinning and we're always Polish. We both happen to be spinning and we're always, always Polish. We never stop. You haven't we, taken a day off. I've we, we've never stopped doing it, Sam. Yeah. We are just so proud of our country. Yeah, good. We're proud of our people who oppress people within itself. But isn't that every country, sure. Sam? Yeah. Every world. So how are you doing? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Busy, busy man. Busy man? Yeah. But you're not too busy to recommend a movie. Uh, no, not, not this time around. I've been too busy to recommend a movie a bunch of times. Well, speaking but... of, speaking of water exchange, wasn't there one called like Hydrosphere he recommended? Oh, I <laughs> well, did, I... we, we will get to. You cannot accuse, accuse me of recommending that to anyone. We have, we have it written down. <laughs> so you did do it. We have evidence. We yeah. could pull up the facts. It's but... just, yeah, but there's a difference between going, Hey, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? And what is a bad movie you would like us to watch? Uh, well, we just said, what are movies you like to wa- want yeah. us to watch? And you chose that. You're yeah, like, this is a movie. I want you to watch movie. it without me. I don't but want you to you... put me through but, but the he, experience he is, of okay. it again. To give context to the listening people I think out it was there, a Facebook comment. Uh, Sam it. has yeah. been on the pod before. It's sure. been 150 episodes since you've been on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're on our first uh, listening people suggestion when my wife, Rachel, suggested The Dark Knight Rises. And we mm-hmm. went, oh, Sam's an expert. In uh, defending superheroes. And then he said something controversial that we got blamed for. <laughs> we never heard. We, we still never still, hear the end of about still, Tom Hardy being uh, like short. I still use that phrase. And <laughs> people, I find it so funny that people like he's coming for Tom Hardy by accurately listing his height. <laughs> How dare he? Because Specifically on a warm day. On a warm you, you, day? You just said that he's, how tall is he? Like 5'9 on a warm day. 5'9 on a nine. warm day. And people, our listeners out there, they got furious. They're like, who's this guy coming in, making fun of Tom? Look, you can mention Tom Hardy's big, luscious, kissable lips, yeah. but you can't make references to the fact that he is short. I, uh, I didn't uh, mean, factually, I, he is short. Let's, let's iron this all out. 
we also did not say like I don't. You, I think no one said he was I, short. I think we li- listen to the tape, people <laughs> listening, people's at home. I didn't say he was short. They're like, how? I think it's how tall is Tom Hardy? And I said five nine on a warm day. And I actually use that to describe my height. Like you know, and these days, yeah, that is shorter than the average man. But you know, it wasn't us going ha ha ha. So you, are you are you willing to say that that that's that's short for the height of an average man? It's shorter than average now. It wasn't like, yeah, it's Bartek. I've got somebody else on my side with this debate because it's... Bartek's Mr. I'm not short, I'm average height, and then uses his height of what is I th- it, five, I think, nine? I think five, as eight. of as of someone now, else has been punching the numbers in, in our country, uh, I think it's taller in America, um, ah. but I think in Australia, I think the average is now 5'10. Sorry, Bartek, oh, okay. you're officially short. It finally happened. Wait, we're taller than Americans in general? No, Americans are taller than us. Yeah. We, oh. We're fatter now, though, so just consider that. Uh, but we are talking about Charlie's Angels, the 2000 film. So if you have not seen this by any chance, we recommend you give it a watch for yourself and then come back and hear us talk about it. We're going to give all the spoilers away. I know the film's over 20 years old, which is a scary thing to really really take in, take in that this is, this is 22 years old, but it is, that's a fact. That's, that's, when, that's when you, true. When that's... you said the title just now, was that the first mention of it in this episode? No. No? No, I think you said it earlier. Okay. Charlie's Angels, starring Drew Barrymore, just... Cameron Diaz, Lucy Liu, Bill Murray? Bill Murray. And, most importantly, we have to mention Tim Curry. Mm. We all love a Curry, and uh, we all love Massimo. Tim. <sighs> so curious. you recommend Musman's okay. You yeah. recommended this, Mister Mister Doctor. Uh-huh. So Pun. why why Pun, Pun Doctor? Doctor. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we if there's if there's a few things that factored into this one. A bunch of my other choices had already been done. <laughs> yeah, 150 of, episodes does that. A lot of other, my other preferences had in fact. And what were your done. other preferences? I think Dude, Where, Dude Where's My Car, I think I threw out there. And oh, I, yeah. I think that was the first one. I was like, oh, here are some ideas. Wait a second. I would fucking love to talk about Dude Where's My Car uh, and <laughs> think back on all of the terrible things about it mm. and all of the fantastic Oh, yeah, the transphobia really aged well. Uh, yeah, well, I think you can look at tran- transphobia in particular. It, it's crazy to think not that long ago the kind of jokes that we were making. But uh, mm-hmm. And by we, I mean you guys, not me personally. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, us uh, specifically. You, 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 rather, you rather brown face humor. That's why you brought Charlie's Angels. In. Of course. I was, on Ryan's, I was on Ryan's other podcast a few weeks ago and I made a racist joke. And and he and he's a hero now for all of the listeners out there. So you also asked to be for fair, it was more all, of a I don't see race kind of uh, thing. And you also <laughs> you also asked for a, a couple of ninja kid films and we've yeah. already done them. And, and I'm like Sam, your first you have episode, a limited you have a limited palette. Yeah, your first episode on the whole movie. podcast. It's was not that I, just... it's not that I have a limited palette. I think it's you know specific. I imagine a, a lot of the guests you know that come onto this. It's like what? Where's your wheelhouse? Why? Mm-hmm. What's a movie? Yeah. That we can justify getting you over anyone else. Ryan literally said, like, oh, we'll have Sam Newton on for the Dark Yeah, Knight so Rises. for the superhero stuff, it makes perfect sense. And I was like, what is a child's ninja movie if not the precursor to, like, superhero stuff? Mm-hmm. It's the same wish fulfillment. It's the same, like, there's a, there's a lot that's the same. And right? it's come back now with stuff like Cobra Kai, the television yeah. series, is a big success, which yeah. banks on the nostalgia of that that craze and is bringing it back and yeah, even 100%. giving it dramatic heft. So does that mean we're going to get three ninjas, the uh, Hulk Hogan <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, reboot yeah. You know what? television series, Netflix? Look, look, look. Hulk Hogan, he, he's been cancelled a couple of times, but I think they'll bring him back, okay? They'll have him for this Three Ninjas TV series. That's me a TV series. Who owns Three Ninjas? Disney, Fox, whoever, I don't you know. You know what they should I'm do? I'm going to guess should do Universal. Universal they should movie have... monsters. They should make it a part of the dark universe. They should <laughs> They should have the Three Ninjas be grown up and training an old man to martial arts. <laughs> that, that... <laughs> All what? jokes aside, that would be awesome. <laughs> I know, right? Some ancient man, like, who's got back problems and sciatica, and these kids are like, move faster, and old gro- man. And growing up, people are like, oh, you must be a martial arts master. He's like, no, I'm, I'm just a normal guy. Yeah. Oh, man, that's if, racist of if, you to say that. If only Christopher, Christopher Plummer was still with us, but that's the role <laughs> he would play. Uh, Why the... And, and, uh, why are these children already experts at like, martial arts? <laughs> How long have they known much? And, 
Mm. And you see their parents are the three ninjas. Yeah. It's like, of course, that's, that's why. That's where you get the, the, the throwback in. You get to the be throwback. like, hey, remember these ninjas? Yeah, look. And they how they the, were recast yeah, for the third film. Yeah, well, we don't talk about that yeah, part of it. I but do. Charlie's Angels is a film that you suggested. Yep. And uh, it was one that came out when we were all young. It's from the 2000. From 2000 so... At least for myself, it was one that was always on television. I always saw it on TV. I think the sequel gets more playtime. Really? I, I, I always felt I saw the first one more because the second one was a little bit more raunchy, so they would play that a little later. There was more Cameron maybe Diaz Maybe that's why I was dance. watching it more often. <laughs> well, I watched... Uh, as, as, a, as a Sam Rockwell head, sure. I was watching this as a, as a young man uh, for the Rockwell factor and yeah. the Luke Wilson appeal. Uh, as Luke we Wilson all, I mean, good. we all loved him in that 70s show as Kelso's older brother, Kelsey, Kelsey, <laughs> Kelsey, 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 all the time. So I watched it on which is, TV Which is a unique history for you, Ryan. I got to see it all the way through. This wasn't a Big Fat Liar thing where I always missed like the first 10 minutes or the last <laughs> 10 minutes. It was always like I missed parts of it when it was on. But no, I always saw this from beginning, middle to end. What about you? Um, so I've seen this duology just once, um, both on the same night, I believe. I was having a sleepover at my stepbrother's house in, I believe, like the late 2000s. I think I was late high school. Um, so yeah, I've only seen them once and I remembered little bits from both of them. There was one big thing that I misremembered. It was like, oh, there was that Bosley character played by like some old British guy. But <laughs> fun fact, everyone, Bill Murray is not British. <laughs> <laughs> but you're probably thinking And he's thinking not of... even doing a British accent. No. No. Like if he was <laughs> doing a British accent. I, get, I think I just wasn't that. aware of him at that time yeah, for some you reason. You probably, well, Zombieland came out by then, Bartek. I didn't see that until a little after. Uh, no, Zombieland was a bit after, I think. Have you guys done Zombieland? Not yet. Bartek? Not yet, but Bartek's a Zombieland head. Okay. Uh, he's seen that and not Shaun of the Dead. So... Take that in for I like all Zombieland. It's for the record, it's, Ryan, it, I don't like Zombieland. I do I not do. like Zombieland. <laughs> I do. Look, look, I love Oscar uh, Best Picture winner Emma Stone like everybody else, sure. but uh, it's not enough for me. But uh, what about you, Mister Mister Doctor Pun Doctor? Uh, Pun, yes. uh, what is your overall relationship with Charlie's Angels? I think I enjoyed the movie when it came out, and it was kind of one of those. It was very much a. It's someone else's. Like you're at someone else's house for the weekend and their parents don't want to have to deal with you. So they Mm. take you to the movies and you see Charlie's angels. And uh, I I think what drew me to it being a good pick for this is it's such a, both films. And I definitely remember the second one better. Like Mm. both films are just goofy as hell. And they're like very much making fun of the genre that they're in and playing, like playing to the camera a bit. Oh, you know? Oh yeah. One of the first lines, yeah, makes fun of the idea of it. With the yeah. TJ Hooker jab about it being a movie. And it's like of an old, old TV, TV yeah, show. Yeah, an old TV show. Like, Which, oh, that went over my head when I watched it. When, it was only afterwards. I'm like, oh, yeah, they did make it. When are they going to come up with something original, you know? And then there's the defense. Well, actually, it's like, yeah, here yeah. we are. So for you, it's the second one sticks in your brain more. But overall, it's the fact that this is over the top yes. silly and fun yes. and uh, yeah, An exaggeration. I am a big fan of the cast of this movie. That's Same. also another reason why I would always gravitate towards it. Uh, Drew Barrymore is uh, she's a star for a reason. She's very charismatic, very likable. She just has that. She's presence. also a little bit of every woman. Like she's she's got that every woman. Everyone can sort of see Drew Barrymore and be like, that's not so far removed from my life and how I see things. Yo, and Drew Barrymore is. She's just been with, for people of our age, she's just been there the whole time. I mean, we saw her in E.T. when we were probably the same age. And then we grow up and then we see her in other things. And then, heck, she was even in weird stuff like, hey, she's a voice and family guy. And she's just in, like, so many projects. But she's just likable in yep. everything. So that's always an an appeal of watching something like Charlie's Angels where the whole thing is it banks on the likability of the angels. Cameron Diaz is another great example where she's likable. You see that big smile on her face and it's an infectious smile. You can't help but be won over by the, the obviously cheesy shot of her flicking her hair back as we know, but it's a smile. That's that Cameron Diaz smile that we love so much. And yes, 
these are all very attractive women and that's a huge selling factor. I mean, as a teenage boy, I know that's a reason why I watched it too. But I just like all of these actresses. Lucy Liu, I always think from Futurama is yeah, one of my favorite Futurama. guest stars. Yeah. And so I just have a an affection for each one of these a- actors, even Bill Murray. And I love Tim Curry especially. So... I always look back at Charlie's Angels as like, this isn't a good movie. Like, I've seen it a million times, and I could not tell you what the plot was before I watched it last night. Because that doesn't matter. It's about seeing seeing Crispin Glover being a freak. And that's also another thing. This is the movie I think of Crispin Glover for. Not Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. Mm. How? If you're young, and this is one of the first things you see him in, this image of him will be burned oh, into your brain it's a forever more, it's forever. a more memorable character than than when he plays george mcfly because george mcfly is just meant again he's like he's your little he's, he's your little dweeb in the 1950s but he's kind of like there's not a lot of <laughs> there's not a lot there in terms of making he's a him, dweeb in the 80s too <laughs> in he, terms well, of making him an interesting and it's person. all on crispin glover's physicality like the thing i remember yes. about george mcfly is how he rubs the back of his neck and he leans his head forward that's like what i remember more of yeah. the character is just the physical stuff and that's what you get throughout all of charlie's angels is he doesn't speak because we'll get to that trivia but it's like you just remember the physicality of crispin all of his actions because that's all he has to him but uh bartek what about you when it comes to this film do you have any relationship or feelings or affection or anything towards any of these actors? Because this is definitely a film where it lets you know quite quite early on, kick back, this isn't about the plot, it's about watching these people. Yeah, from very early in this film, uh, there was a very comforting effect of, you know, when we started this podcast... Almost everything we did was from the 2000s, you know, typically the (laughs) early to mid. And this was like the comfortable zone. Like, even though this was like, you know, the very beginning of the 2000s, it was like, oh, it's right in there. It felt immediately 2000s. It it felt immediately 2000s, feel immediately comforting. And yeah, as as the film went on, like, I didn't know everyone who was in it, but there were just a lot of cast members like, oh, you're in this? Great. You're in this? Great. 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 Yeah. It was fun. And yeah, I, I agree. Like, the plot... Yeah, it's a typical, like, spy action-y kind of plot. Like, you know, you got a bit of a heist here, villains, turns, things like that. Um, but, yeah, it, it's really the energy of the film and, like, the the character archetypes, you know, mm. playing out and being fun. And with the age difference between us and you, Sam, you talked about when you were... Whoa! <laughs> what all three, three years, my friend, Sam. all three years. You're, you're so ancient. No, no. Ooh. You have a large nostalgia and affection for the Kid Ninja films, yes. which I don't, and I don't think you really do, Bartek, either. I feel like that no, was just yeah. a little bit beyond us. Yeah. But what I do have is the spy caper okay. stuff, because we had Spy Kids, Charlie's Angels, uh, Catch That Kid... Like, just all of those, I felt like Agent we... Cody Banks. Agent, Agent Cody Banks. Was, again, three years isn't that yeah, big but what I'm saying, those movies But too, what I'm man. saying is, those three years gave you a lot more of the ninja stuff. Yeah. And for us, it, yeah, a no, lot more of, like, 90s, kids with it's glasses 90s, that have 3D. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> 90s was about, like, yeah, again, what you spoke to before with Cobra Kai is, like, off the back of success, like Karate Kid in, in the, I believe, was, like, late 80s. Yeah. And then you, it's like, oh, let's let's cash in in that cow. And ki- people people think karate is cool now. Let's make stuff about karate. Or and Game then, Gears. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then in the, in the 2000s, we're looking at Y2K, and people are like, computers are cool. So kids using computers is cool. And kids... Like doing somersaults and flipping, but not in a ninja way, but in a, in a we're spiral. dodging lasers. It's different because Antonio Banderas is here and <laughs> and, and fucking Daddy Treo's here. And so Spy Kids movies, or I would love the Spy Kids movies. I love them <laughs> too. I I, but I, I think of Charlie's Angels just yeah. slotting in that in my yes. in my youth and my development of media when I was young. Of just there were so many shows and movies like Charlie's Angels, where there was just this push for, don't you want to see a bunch of cool, badass, but also dorky people running around doing uh, espionage and capers and thrillers stuff and all of that? And that was like, it was so nice to come back to Charlie's Angels last night to see that again, because I feel like I personally don't engage with these type of movies anymore, even if they're around. It feels like there's not as strong an abundance of them. And if they are, they're a lot more... 
They take themselves grim. They take. The, I was about to say they take themselves seriously. The Bourne. There's the, yeah. Jason Bourne. That and you know James Bond has existed forever. There's been spy stuff forever. Italian Job, the heist genre. You know, there's mm. lots of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, no one's no one's take uh, the Bourne changed what we look for in those movies mm-hmm. uh, for sure. And then Casino Royale. And then Casino followed that sort of like mm-hmm. shaky cam parkour is cool again. And we had Layer sort of... Cake and uh, Brick as well yeah. in there. It was like let's get more serious, let's get serious. and artsy, and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But at the same time. I want this type of Charlie's Angels and not the one that came out just recently. Where I looks... also enjoyed the recent one, uh, but I think I'm a forgiving audience in a lot of a lot of things. You you see you see Elizabeth Banks and you go, I'm in. That's what that's what you're. <laughs> she's she's just funny. I wouldn't say she was the like the selling point. She's the, the movie, director. But... Yeah, but that, come on, you know, I I see stuff from directors I don't necessarily like. That's true, Is that though. film supposed to be like a sequel to this? Kind of. Yeah. yeah, and they're all sequels to the original television. Yeah, series. the the idea is that like these angels have been going on forever, and mm-hmm. yeah, this is the it's voice of the in this version. Charlie's the voice from the original TV show, yeah. so it's on and on. And then they even have gags in the second movie about former angels with Demi Moore and yeah. actual former angels from the TV show. So it's like in a way. The Charlie's Angel cinematic universe has been going on for literal decades. So that's mm. that's the answer to I, and your question an, there. I but... suppose another interesting thing, you know, Ryan, you talked about this being right there, two thousand, right mm. around that sort of nostalgia for us. We're all audience, you know, we're all audience members who watched Charlie's Angels without, you know, unlike an adult audience at the time, they're like, oh, I enjoyed the original television show. We're just mm. like, I've been put in a movie cinema <laughs> by my friend's mum. And well, this is on Channel 10. Oh, this is on Channel 10, <laughs> and I don't know the, the intellectual property before coming into it. So I think that's an, another factor to keep in mind when you're looking mm. at our experience of the movie, is we were not the target audience in any way, shape, or form. But there's a fun thing about, because we look today, and there's like a nostalgia for the 80s a lot, and yet, so there's a lot of young people who haven't even seen a John Carpenter movie, yet they know the iconography of a John Carpenter thing. And I feel the same when we were growing up with, say, 60s, 60s and 70s. We grew up mm. with that 70s show, for Christ's sake. So you understood who, who like, Charlie's Angels were because they were referencing that a lot. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. when I was watching this, they kick in the theme song, and I was a kid being like, yeah, throwback. And I'm not even <laughs> having seen an episode no. of Charlie's Angels, but, like, through the osmosis Ooh, of, like... Yeah, kids right, and kids right now are super into the 80s and 90s. So you're... you're like, and, even, and actually, yeah. and a little bit of early 2000s coming back yeah, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Nunez is coming back. Nunez is coming back for the kids. Hillary, yeah, that's even when I heard Charlie's voice in this film, I'm like, oh, that feels old. Like this, not in a bad way, but like this no, feels, feels like this could have been the guy who actually did it and it was. There's a level of, that's Charlie. Yeah. That That is Charlie. I guess, I mean, because you mostly <laughs> hear his voice through like electronics, so, like they could have, I guess, filtered it the same way or something. But it's him. It's John Forsyth, who's been in a million things, but, uh... Let's get into, I guess, uh, some of the hijinks that ensue in this. Uh, in this, so for you, Bartek, you have less of a, a connection and familiarity with this in comparison to Sam and I. So, what were some things that just leapt out at you? Things that maybe made you laugh, or things that you were like, "Whoa, that's a lot of." What what just jumped towards you? Um, so definitely, we've made it clear on the show that we enjoy Cameron Diaz in a lot of films because she's always really funny. Lot of ener- uh, very energetic. Um, we I didn't. Co- we covered her last film. She retired, and she's yeah, coming back. She, she's she coming sang. Back. She sang in that one. Yeah, she did. She yeah. did. And little danced. girls, little girls, and yeah. dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but because I didn't remember much about this film, uh, the the character archetypes weren't in my head. I was surprised and really enjoyed how goofy she was in this. Very dorky. Mm. Wasn't expecting that. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> because, just to give some clarifications, the movies we've covered of Cameron Diaz are in the later part of her career where she's playing, like, executive business women. Or who, mums. Or, like, no, yeah. we haven't done yeah, anywhere. No, yeah. She's a mum. Okay. She, uh, mum really, she, she ran an orphanage in the She ran an orphanage in, <laughs> in Annie. Annie yeah. But we've seen her play, like, the... 
I'm the mature one, and I'm getting into silly scenarios. Oh, that was like, like other, the, 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 the other, other woman. The other woman. woman. And was she also in Night and Day? Yes, and Night and Day, where she was a little bit more klutzy, but not a full buffoon. But she, she was more like straight manning to Tom Cruise. It's like, what? You knocked me out. Yeah. So we've seen her on the pod through that lens of the later part of Cameron Diaz's career, where she's no longer just the the ditzy blonde bombshell, which sure. is what they're playing mm. to here. Mm. So it's actually interesting to hear you discuss it because I, I I just think of Cameron. Diaz well, I mean, but, as a whole, like her whole yeah. career. So I look at this going, yeah, this is something about Mary era uh, Cameron Diaz. It's- well, come to think of it, actually, this is around the same time as Shrek, where like that did a lot of, you know, uh, subverting of like princessy tropes. Like, oh, look, she's the princess that I, you're saving, I, but like she's... I always forget that she's in that. I would say <laughs> that this also, you know, we refer to archetypes and then there's countertypes that sort of mm. go against. I think there's a lot of countertypes in these characters as well. Like, mm. I would, I, before, we, uh, one of the things that I like about both films and stand out is something I really enjoyed and actually something I've wanted to do with when making my own stuff is the montage to introduce a character mm-hmm. full of exciting scenarios that we have not been privy to. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, oh, here's a car going off a cliff and she's backflipped out of it. And, and I think, uh, in Cameron Diaz's like little, here's a snapshot of who this person was before becoming a secret agent. Like there's like the retainer in the mouth. Uh-huh. There's like the, it's, they give like, oh, this is the blonde ditzy bombshell that you are here to see. But she was also like champion of the spelling. Bee. Yeah. She, and yeah. she was a dweeb who turned she out went, to be she, hot. She went on Jeopardy. And... Yes. Mm-hmm. And throughout the film, like she keeps bringing these facts out of nowhere. It's like, oh, yeah, she's the, a the, genius. The ditzy, like almost bimbo one, like no knows everything basically yeah and she heard like the bird tweet it's like oh this is where he is yeah oh, that, yeah that was a and good she eats moment. the <laughs> shit the bird, like when she tastes the scat the, ah a northern swallow yeah and they all have their varying degrees of uh stupidity to them yeah. but also competence yeah and mm. so there's that level of fun because i think there's a lot of critique nowadays whether you find validity in it or not where you have these type of characters and their women is like to be empowering, they have to be flawless. And there's like give mm. and take with that. And it's like in this movie, it's like, no, Cameron Diaz is still like stupid, but also not. She can do all of this cool Kung Fu and she can figure out the bird thing. And, and Drew Barrymore is excellent in these ways, but not in these ways. Yeah. And like, who knew that Chad would be so important to the plot? <laughs> <laughs> Our favorite, uh, Freddie Got Fingered himself, Tom Green, uh, a movie we have covered, Freddie Got Fingered. So uh, what a film. Uh, I know the next one. It's also <laughs> Tom Green in it. Uh, have you, Road you, Trip? You won't have seen it. Uh, it's called Grind. No. All right, that's the next one. That's the next one. Uh, Sam put his finger up. I he put said, my That's finger the up in the air. One. That's the next Do we one. count that as a listen to people's choice? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Sam, Sam has to listen for that. Um, so, yeah. so that's that's a rub there. We'll get on the person Sam hates most, whoever that is. Uh, yeah. One of the things that leapt out at me on this watch that really took me by surprise is the direction of this. I really appreciated the... Uh, audacity and uh, earned arrogance of the filmmaking and yes. the editing and it's very 2000s it's very showy but it added to a lot of the humor and a lot of just the overall sensation and style and when they were doing certain moves and certain things I was catching myself going yeah that's right this is from Charlie's Angels isn't it like when they fall down the bell tower the clock tower whatever they've fallen down in the, the end where the bell falls down you, the two women like jump at each other in the air and they like lock their shoulders in and they fall down and they're just stiff I'm like yeah that's right that this is, is so... this is so Charlie's Angels and so there's a lot of choreography and a lot of shot compositions but that editing is comedy perfection where it just keeps cutting and cutting and cutting and Guy Ritchie's just salivating somewhere watching this but Mick G's already here making sure that he's going to do Terminator 4 <laughs> <laughs> and Christian Bale's going to get real mad and I just was really blown away by the directing because Mick G is kind of a joke he's a I've got one name and people often talk about him in with derision because of something like Terminator mm. or because these Charlie's Angels movies aren't looked upon favorably they've got low ratings low reviews they're they're silly, they're fluff films, they're not 
artistically driven, but I actually have a soft spot for McGee in some places. I really liked uh, his somewhat recent films. What was it? The Babysitter's Club or something with Samara Weaving. I rather enjoyed those films. They're, 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 they're just fun. And uh, so I was looking at the direction this time rather than all the cast and the gags and all the people that turned up and the music. Oh, the music is very important Music's as phenomenal, well. Yeah. The music, the music is sl- it slapped immediately. Yeah. Immediately. I'm like, oh, here we go. We're in it. I, you're, you're in the ride. And I think that also speaks to the time. Like uh, y- you said that a lot of the editing is very Charlie's Angels. And I think that throws back to 70s editing. Even like, you know, things like Star Wars, when mm. people pull up, like the fact that they have wipes in the transitions. Mm. <laughs> so in this Charlie's Angels, there's a lot of like wipe transitions and rotating transitions that we mm. don't do anymore because they're silly. <laughs> But were of the time in the in the original Charlie's Angels series that actually make them so fun to watch and endearing and endearing. Yeah. Now that you think of it, now that you th- now that you say it, and I think of it, um, whenever like this, often when they have songs in this film, it would be like over a scene, like playing in the background while stuff's going mm. on. And that was sticking out to me for some reason. I we think, don't do it as much anymore. Yeah. We, we, Normally, when we have a song, it's like oh, a scene's beginning or ending, or there's like a transition. And, um, and action set pieces are often, not all the time, but often accompanied by just score. Yeah. Mm. And, or just basic, like, EDM music or something. But here, you have a scene where, <laughs> where Crispin Glover's facing off against Lucy Liu. It's all silent, beautiful slow motion, and then you hear a guitar just gently start shredding in the background, and then you just hear a guy going... <gasps> let's go and it's just like oh the music's kicking in yeah. now the action's gonna kick in and makes you sit there pumping your fist going fuck yes just just it's like kicking you, each yeah. other if, it's like if you know all the songs names and you look at like the soundtrack you can say like oh that's the song from that scene rather than like oh yeah that song was somewhere in the film and, and that's yeah. the thing to consider they're also trying to sell a soundtrack to the yeah. film which is which was very important uh, still is but very very important in this era of these movies mm. I think also like somewhere along the line we uh we stopped using you know pre-existing songs we started as as you said Ryan like we we write scores, scores and yeah. and we might at the beginning or the end of a scene to accentuate like have a recognizable song but in a lot of those instances the su- the music is also diegetic like it's happening mm. in the world it's like baby driver the you mm-hmm. know the headphones are in so you know the character is listening to that song mm. i think somewhere along the way I, I i don't know what the justification is i would maybe say like a, like people don't want to appear to be lazy because it's mm. like, oh, what would be a perfect song for this? Well, let's have some strings. Or it's like, no, that perfect song is, exists and it's Ooh Barracuda. And <laughs> like, we'll just use that. It's already there, but we it, don't do that anymore. It's, it, it does remind me of in Iron Man when it finally played Iron, Iron Man. Iron Man. And you're like, we've earned this. We did it. We earned this. We waited the whole film and we thought, you know what? Maybe they're not going to do it. Whereas Charlie's Angel said... <laughs> You deserve, you already deserve, you for, for sitting in this seat and paying me the admission ticket, you deserve the right song choice for this sequence. Mm, so what changed for you on this watch, Sam? Uh, well, uh, anyone who's listened to any of the episodes that I've been on before will not be surprised to know that I didn't watch this leading into the podcast. Uh, I, I always refuse to. Uh, I like to come right. in, I like to come in with an un, I like filtered. to come in with an unfiltered mind. Um, so I don't think anything's changed because I didn't watch it. Uh, wow. And I know you told me to, and I never will. Uh, wow. You, stick it to the man. Stick it to uh, the man. So you missed out on <laughs> Sam Rockwell's dancing. I, I, I won't say I've missed out on it because I've seen it and I, it, was a, it was a joy. Um, but did you know that there's almost 10 to 15 minute long compilations on YouTube of, of just him dancing dancing? in all of his movies? Because apparently he dances a lot. Does, yeah. I never uh, that realized that. Me. We've had Sam Rockwell on the pod for Moon and he danced in that. Mm. Jeez. Yeah. He's like Christopher Walken is, where Walken's always dancing in is his Is the movie. challenge Was to G-Force? find a yes. compilation of him not dancing what are they, like show me only the like show me the movies where at not not even for a jig not even a little wag of the hand not even a little bump of the head G-force? well he's a voice in g-force so, so he's vocally so my question dancing. that hamster dance it probably sure it, it, like, yeah. guinea, i can't remember whether they're, they're guinea pigs because g-force yeah right? please uh so that <laughs> there's gotta have and, there's gotta be a scene where the guinea pigs dance of course yeah. it's the end credits yes. that's what they always do with those <laughs> movies are you kidding that's the movie where nicholas cage plays 
played a star nosed uh, mole, and he had one of my favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite lines ever in any of these movies we've watched. Where there's a flashback to his father getting taken away in a cage where they're on a golf course or whatever, and his dad, who's also voiced by Nicolas Cage, just says very gingerly and seriously to him, "Son, when you grow up, make sure to take your revenge out on humanity." And he's like, "I will, Dad." <laughs> and his voice is this kind of nerdy kind of voice. Oh, oh boy. But, uh, uh, a thing that uh, another thing to to mention about Charlie's Angels is it's an excuse to have all of these scenes where you have the actresses in silly outfits and playing little characters and little things like Lucy Liu is going to play the dominatrix that comes into the office with a ride with like a stick and she's like hitting it on the table and yeah. people looking at her ass and she's like I know you're looking and they're like I'm so sorry and it's like yeah. no it's fine or you have them as like the the the, uh, German the Germans and Bill Murray's got a big tuba and stuff like that and so for you Bartek did you have any favorite of those because that's a, like a huge appeal of it it's, it's like it's, a fun, it's one it? of the most fun parts there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of like costuming stuff going on like there's even the part where two of them like dress up as men yeah so yeah I was fun. distressed by male Drew Barrymore very much <laughs> very much yeah, it really makes you look at yourself and go what do I feel <laughs> I thought it was going to be like it makes me really look at myself and go yeah I look like male I, Drew I look Barrymore. like male Drew Barrymore had like a big muscly guy look at them and it's like oh man I could strive to that sort of manliness yeah. but, I tried <laughs> but was there one that you had a favorable reaction towards uh, one that you liked because for me, I, I couldn't help but love the opening where we have Drew Barrymore is LL Cool J. Yeah. She should have she should have kept the disguise on the whole movie, I think, <laughs> and revealed it at the end. Or... <laughs> no, no, that would ruin it. That would ruin it. Keep it on. Right. She reveals it at the press tour. For the you know movie. what? She can take it off in the bloopers. That was me the whole time. It was like um, I think recently there's the new Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio movie and yeah. Kate Blanchett's in it, but she, all she does is monkey noises. So it's like you've got arguably the best actress currently there's, working, and all she does is make go ooh, ah, ooh, ah, noises a, throughout the entire movie. There's a long history of animated films getting incredibly talented people to do animal noises. I think like one of my favorite little clips is of Alan uh, Tudyk or Tudyk. Yeah, I, I yeah Alan Tudyk. We did uh, him recently for Death at a Funeral. Yeah, I, I like that one. That's a great Way one. Way back in early South Park, they got like big late night show hosts just to make like meowing or barking noises. Yeah, it was Jay Leno was the cat, I believe. In <laughs> yeah. Park. Wasn't and, George Clooney infamously a yeah. dog? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's and, like, bow well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Alan Tudyk is in Moana. And originally when they did Moana, the chicken had a larger part to play. <laughs> But they have, uh, there's a clip of him, you know, near the mic, very similar to what we're sort of doing now, and going up, and then he just like turns to the camera and goes, I went to Juilliard. <laughs> he did. I, I went to the most prestigious acting school And then in Frank the world. Welker walks in and's like, yeah, did you? Yeah. Did you? <laughs> and he's like, and here I am making chicken noises. And that's and that's how we get a like a successful movie. You put Alan Tudyk in there to make noises. And he does a great chicken noise. Like, <laughs> great sorry, thing. Alan, you shot yourself in the foot there. Jeez, it's hard to pick just one costume because so many of them were fun. Like the the German girls, it's like, oh, this was unexpected. Um, they wear some Indian stuff at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they wore like kimonos in like mm-hmm. the bathhouse. Yeah, yeah, the uh, massage house. Yeah, Drew Barrymore did go brown face and brown body in this. She was the only one out of the three that did. I I just want to note that down. I don't know why she had to. <laughs> I think she wasn't even dancing. It's she's... like a scene where it's like they're doing belly dancing, and she comes over as the waitress to grab the bottle. It's like you don't need to be in brown face. It's because face for she's this. the producer, Ryan. Oh, so she's to blame even more. It's so weird because blame? Cameron Diaz. <laughs> Cameron Diaz is also like the logic. I don't know. It's just one of the things when you think about the behind the scenes, and you go, okay. Then, for some reason, you go, okay, they already have Lucy Liu, so they're not going to put her in brown face, because I guess the logic is, she's already a person of colour, so they're not going to do that. But then Cameron Diaz is there, and all she has is just more extravagant, like, eye makeup. Like, like just, like, she's got, like, blue eyeliner, and it's all this wacky can't stuff. Maybe two white people and then, and, and then Drew, <laughs> Two white people? No, no, no joke, Sam. Drew Barrymore comes around the corner, and it's a surprise. Like, that, and, like the camera swooshes in, and it's Drew Barrymore, just brown. Like, yeah. fully. Maybe, and it's like, why? Maybe it was Tom Green's idea. Uh, oh. Could have been. He, yep. Now, his costume was great. Yeah. <laughs> he was great. I think, again, it's in the second one, but one of my favorites is 
in the in the second film, there's a, a big portion of the film where they have to go to like the shipyard, and they, they and somehow there's a burlesque show that happens mm. in the shipyard. I'm not mm. talking about the burlesque show. I just thought I'd bring that back to everyone's attention. It is there. But it is there. But there, there's a phenomenal part where they're like there during the day, mm. and they get the little message like a oh, target's in, and they're all welding the side of a ship <laughs> in just overalls. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, not disguising themselves at all. And it's the three of them on the ship. So it's not like, oh, I'm pretending to weld the ship while someone else is doing the espionage. We're all here welding, getting the, like, we noticed the ship needs welding. Uh, and everyone is going to look up and go, there are three women welding that ship. Uh, and then they, like, get the, like, cue to leave. And they, like, yeah. And then they, like, dive off the ship into the ocean and then it cuts to like th- them at night. And I'm like, even me young, I think like the second one is 2004 mm-hmm. or something around there. A few years uh, later. You know, I'm going, I'm 14 going, they didn't need to be well in the ship. But they wanted to. <laughs> there's like, it's like in this a... movie where they're at the car track and like Drew Barrymore gets way into doing the car yeah, stuff. She's like, they're like, I'm going to, yeah. Could you go over there now? The, she's like, oh, yeah, I got to do the seduction of the guy in the car where I lick the wheel of the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But also, I need to fix this. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's so funny because it's like the job is like you want to be here so that you're around when something happens so you can get the information inconspicuously. And every single time they're like, I'm going to be directly involved with this car race, I'm going to be welding a ship can speak when like, you could just be like moving crates from one place to another and be as invisible as you needed to be. But the three but, of them are welding but, a ship. But, what's more fun? But at no, the same how, time, yeah. you know, there's no the, hot sparks. The, the, if you're just carrying a crate from one spot to the other. Reminds yeah, you but, of like a uh, Wayne's world two when they're like all dressed as the village people when they're yeah. doing like separate incognito disguises. Uh, my favorite disguise was when for some reason, Cameron Diaz gets into a, like a full body white suit to do the, the, like to get in the room to grab the, like do the flips over the yeah. thing. And there's a floor with all the sensors on it. And she has to make sure to jump from this to this, this, but the corridor leading to it's fully white. So she goes into a full white outfit, but like, she turns and waves at the camera and her face is visible. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, there's so no point. Up until that point, you're like, ah, oh, she's white. So then on, but, the, but on also, the camera, maybe she sort of like, mm-hmm. just sort of blends it. And then she turns to the camera. Yeah, but there's also another fact of she's walking towards the door, which has like a big red circle on it. And she stands right in front of the big red circle. So now there's a white human silhouette body shape like in, in front the, of it. I'm like, I just love if, if the journey. The, the loot it, because here's the thing. <laughs> that's not supposed to be funny. Like, that's me laughing at the yeah. film because there's no joke. Like, they don't play that for comedy. Like, with the other things, they, play, yeah, they do. But that there, set. it's like, oh, they were just, you know, that's fine. You know what? I'm fine with that. <laughs> that's okay. It's like if that journey down the corridor was like a three-act structure, like the middle act, she was kind of invisible, but the beginning and end, it's like, well, there she is. Oh, another laugh out loud moment for me was Sam Rockwell's hair when he was playing up the I'm the nerdy computer guy that's been kidnapped golly gee aren't i romantic yeah. and then when he's a villain he combs it back to the normal sam rockwell hair we all know and it's like <laughs> hey there he is there's our guy but at first he's like he's got like the shaggy 2000s like you know oh golly gee i just learned what a forum is type hair and it's yeah. just like i just they, found they, that really funny i was like, like clark like, kent you know superman of it all but they're doing the thing that we all love which is when you have a, 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 a beautiful or handsome person and they're trying to make them not that so they're like comb their hair down give them braces or big glasses so no one and- will notice how handsome they are or beautiful i'm like it never works like always see through yeah (laughs) Yeah. jennifer's body where it's like yeah no one will notice that amanda seyfried's just as fucking stacked just like the (laughs) again one of the most beautiful women in in the world she was in mean girls as the pretty one (laughs) like in in the mean girl she's the one who's like no but she's say (laughs) karen should win she's prettier than everyone but she's too dumb (laughs) no but she's next to megan fox yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) we're yeah we're supposed to believe that the uh, entire school is like i will not talk look at in the her pretty, direction at the pretty blonde one because yeah. there is a slightly more attractive within this film's universe brunette standing next to her. yeah we have a thinner brunette next to this now frumpy blonde it's like shut up it's like shut up I, I i say this a lot with like anne hathaway princess diaries mm. 11 year old me was like you trying to make me believe that that girl's not 
the prettiest girl in school because she has curly hair. Well, he, and, and yeah. glasses, and that one like those and, those and are eyebrows. her those are her obstacles. And they eyebrows. don't even do that much to her eyebrows. No, but they They're try like, to make it like oh, and the they eyebrows make it too. seem like the eyebrows are a part of the makeover, and like from <laughs> pick one to pick two, they're like marginally. Different. I always use Michelle Pfeiffer in Batman Returns as the great example <laughs> of that as well, where it's like, oh, guys, no, you're not supposed to notice that fucking Michelle Pfeiffer is one of the hottest people on the earth right now. No, she's got glasses on it. She's got like. Really her frizzy. Messy. Her, ooh, and she's wearing a surprisingly tight secretary outfit, but that, hey, hey, don't sexualize that. It's when she gets in the dominatrix outfit. That's when you get there. It's like, hey, no, no, no. Stop, stop trying to play with me, Batman it's Returns. It's, I know what you're it's doing. because we're meant to see through the eyes of Batman, and Batman finds the dominatrix sexy because of the lack of control he feels. No, it's life. about seeing through the eyes of Christopher Walken, how he sees her before and after, yeah, okay. and now he's That's afraid. Good. He's so, afraid of a he's strong... He's afraid of powerful, <laughs> sexy a, women. Uh, he does have one of the best lines where he, his lesson is to just throw her from a higher build, like higher part of the building next time. That's his lesson that he learns. He's like, you know, next time I keep meet her, I should throw her from a higher level of the building to make sure she dies more. But uh, Bartek, you were going to touch upon something? Um, well, how about a very obvious question? You know, of our three options... Who is our favourite? Tom Green, Luke Wilson, or the Friends guy? Luke Wilson. Luke Easily. Will- it has to be Luke Wilson. Luke, Luke, he has my favourite gag in <laughs> either film, by the way. And, I, and you know what it Let's is. Let's hear it. It is, he's trying to get to dance with Cameron Diaz at Soul Train. Mm-hmm. And she gets up there and she dances. And there's a whole gag about like all the black the women bounces, looking or... at her going, oh. ah, there's a white lady who's got no ass dancing and trying to shake her ass like she's got one. But then they move on from that. And here's the bouncers next to him. And he's riffing. He's talking to them, but they're not talking to him. And it's like, you get this impression that the bouncers aren't even acknowledging his existence, but not even out of a sense of malice, just they are too busy looking themselves. Mm. They're like Buckingham Palace guards. They're yes. Like, they're and, on duty. And, that, and that... then Cameron Diaz goes to the toilet and she gets attacked and she's like, I got to go because they're trying to kill all my friends. And she goes to Luke Wilson and she gives him like the, I like you. I want to meet you again, but I, I, got, go, I got to go. <laughs> and he's like, Luke Wilson, where he's like, oh, golly gee. Okay, well... That's fine by me. Like, no hard feelings and genuinely no hard feelings from the mm-hmm. guy because he's just a... He, he, he's, he's so he's, sweet. He's so sweet. Yeah. And then she runs off and then she runs back and gives him a big kiss. And he's like, oh, oh, wow. And he's shocked. And he turns around. I laughed so And, and the, <laughs> one of the bouncers immediately was like, hey. <laughs> and gives him a point. And then they all sit down together and they start having a conversation like in between the cuts of the movie. These guys have and become the, big friends. Yeah. So now they're having to talk where it's like, Luke was like, look, I, 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 like I was saying to you guys, you, you got to give a little to get a little. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, even just his initial reaction. I was like, yeah, finally, you guys broke. Yeah. And I, I lost, I for, completely forgot about, I completely forgot about Luke Wilson in my memory. Mm. I remembered Tim Curry, yeah. Chris Glover, Sam Rockwell, uh, 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 Joey from Friends, Matt LeBlanc. Like, I remember these people, <laughs> but for some reason, Luke Wilson left my brain, which is a real tragedy, because I love Luke Wilson. He's my favourite yeah. Wilson. I've... And uh, I mean that, truly. I love him. You know, Idiocracy, that 70s show, uh, you know, all the other movies that we've done on the pod. Old when School. Luke... Old School, yeah, that's a good one. Um, any other any other ones we've done on the pod where Luke Wilson just turns up, you're like, hey, he just always makes... Just to be a regular man. <laughs> oh, Around the World in 80 Days, where he's like Owen Wilson's younger brother, yeah, just yeah, crazy yeah, casting yeah, choice. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, they call him uh, One Take Wilson because he always gets it done in one take. It, it, like, a lot of his, like, gags in that dance club scene is just him, like, looking at the action and, like, commentating over it. And that type of comedy, I think, in general, like, I don't enjoy, but he just nails it so much. A part of the humour is he's genuinely supportive, when yeah. in the other version of this movie, he's supposed to be played as... I was hoping to get the dance with the girl, but she's too busy being the mm. eye candy for everyone else. Golly, but no, he's genuinely like, good on you, Cameron Diaz. Yeah. Good for you. I'm so in, proud yeah, of you. In like a dark, right? moody movie, that would be like his like, start of villainy. Like, there's oh, no... she's got the attention. Or like <laughs> drama between yeah. the two because, oh, yeah. she's too busy being a secret agent or being too busy being the beautiful blonde bombshell. But like, there's no, like if this was Ben Stiller in this role, like that's what it would be. Yeah. But there's no sense of any of that from Luke Wilson at any point in the movie. So he's, 
He's got he's that. Just happy to be there. He's got that. <laughs> like, he's, I'm just happy to be here. He's got that infectious Wilson optimism that yeah. we love from Owen, especially, which I don't often think about with uh, Luke as off. Like when I think of him in that '70s show, as Pelso Kelso, as, as yeah, Pelso Kelso. He his character's kind of like a scumbag, but mm. also it kind of feels like he's too oblivious to even realize what a scumbag <laughs> he is. So I kind of let him off the like hook the... with that. I'm like, ah, you know what? You're fine. I like his reaction to Cameron Diaz doing the robot. Like, oh, the robot. Nice. <laughs> I feel like you can make like a meme out of that, like reaction to like robots in like shows or whatever. It's just like, oh, the robot. Yeah, nice. Robot, nice. That's but, what we all came to uh, see. To His get... oldest brother was in the film. Yeah. He was oh. a chauffeur, apparently. Oh, the one that... Uh, Andrew Wilson. Is that the scene where uh, uh, Drew Barrymore's hitting yeah, on him? Yeah, apparently that's Andrew oh, Wilson. Oh, there you go. Where uh, Drew Barrymore has the cleaver, John, she like licks the wheel of the car. And I loved his reaction. That was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> In like, 20 oh, years, COVID will mean this is bad. Golly, well, he cleaned it immediately. Yeah. He, 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 uh, look, that's even for me, I'm like, that's a lot. That's a lot, Drew. That's that, you're, you're going for <laughs> I it. don't know. I, like, it's, it's a, it's did a, he have Wilson it's energy? It's a wheel of a car in the sun. Like, this is an open open roof car sure. and i'm like that's gonna be a hot wheel but i i think you know any single man in a scenario where a woman like drew barrymore comes over and licks a car for you you're gonna be like this is a good day licks it clean because we're so dead. <laughs> <laughs> like I just... oh, this this woman may be insane but she's seemingly mm. very attracted to me there's the, i talk about this a lot with my wife oh, and we watch movies or shows or things about like actors or actresses that we find cute uh-huh. or or sexy yeah. and it's like i will find i find i mean drew barrymore cute i just think she's very cute i'm like oh, she's so cute and then that scene happens I'm like drew you're you're getting into the sexy territory and it's like <laughs> oftentimes these actors like these actors or actresses they don't get to cross that boundary a lot for me. Like usually, I'm like, look, Kristen Bell, she's hot as hell in this movie, but I still think she's cute. Just in every, you know, I just think she's so cute. Here, Drew, I'm like, whoa, Drew, calm down. I mean, you're gonna try and out, you're trying, you're doing out, you're doing, you're outdoing Cameron Diaz. I think interestingly enough, Cameron Diaz doesn't hit sexy in a, in most of the movies that I've seen her in. And again, it might just be like personal. What about like, the mask? That was the exception I was coming into this uh, sentence with. The mask is different. She's, but you know, there's, there's also a difference between playing a character, say like in, uh, there's something about Mary where the idea is she's like the girl next door mm-hmm. and she's sexy because she's attractive, but mm-hmm. like her personality is cute, accepting fun and, mm-hmm. and kind. And then a thing where the mask, where she is meant to be the object of a lure mm. for, for multiple characters. I think, um, you know, when you say Drew Barrymore is sexy in this in a way that she's not in other movies, it's very much like my wife and I were talking about this literally yesterday. Uh, Joan Cusack in The Adams Family. She's like, Joan Cusack doesn't play characters who are like sexy, sexy but undeniably in The Adams Family values. Like she's the Adams sexy family, as hell. She is sexy and she's not like, yeah, it, it, it's by design that the character, we're meant to be like, yeah. And we're bi- I'm a big John Cusack fan, so I know exactly what we're talking about. Where usually she plays meek. Yeah, she's stuffy. She's you know, oh, the guy has to work really hard to get in a relationship with her because she's so internalized. Yeah. like who, who School of Rock. Who she play in that film? Uh, in Adam's Family Values, yeah. she's the she's villainess, Fester's wife. She's oh, the one who okay. seduces. Fester Look, into I could accept family. all of these things, but pastels, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, she's great in that. Um, I loved her in Gross Point Blank, where she's acting against John Cusack, but they're not brother and sister in the movie, but they look like, like it, because they are. Something like that. <laughs> and yeah. they never reference it, <laughs> I and, I and it really it's... upsets me a lot. <laughs> it's like if any of the uh, Dave Franco, James Franco, oh, God. They're like, well, they can't be in the same movie <laughs> together. They're, it's copy and paste on their face. No, it's called The Disaster Artist, but, and you're going but, to watch that. I have watched it. The... It's a great movie. Was it I called The Masterpiece? The Disaster mm-hmm. No, The Disaster Artist. I the book bu- because I, I in my head it's always like the oh. disaster artist but I heard in the podcast recently like oh they're releasing it soon it's called the masterpiece no I'm no like, it's called disaster artist yeah it came out didn't they change the movie name to the masterpiece no 
Not that I, I know saw of. the film. Unless it's one of those things because I heard, like I heard that Zootopia, thing... Zootopolis, where they sometimes change localized the release. Yeah, because again, in my head, because I've read the book, I know it's the Disaster Artist, but I heard that old podcast mention the masterpiece. Like, oh yeah, they did change it at some point. Am I in like and a they changed Mandela? It back. They changed it back. Okay. I don't know. I've never heard that information. I just saw the movie. We're in not the theater. calling you a liar. We're just this is like Mandela know. effect. Like I'm yeah, in the maybe. different timeline. No, maybe. Do you have a favorite angel? Yeah. Um, well, you didn't give us the favorite guy yet. Oh, yeah. Who's my your favorite fa- guy? I, I, would, I like, I'm going to say Matt LeBlanc because I think, uh, like, you know, Chad is so funny and it's a very funny, like, ending. Like, was it the Chad? It wasn't the Chad. The Chad was great. And I like, like, you know, putting that guy on a happy note. Like, so happy that he puts himself inside of his own boat at the end. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, the... Uh, you know, Drew Barrymore's character follows up with Kristen Glover in the sequel. So it's like, you know, that doesn't follow through. That's the con- wait. What? You know, there's there's this chemistry between uh, Drew Barrymore's character. She like rips off his hair and sniffs it. So there's like these other things going mm-hmm. on. Yeah, Crispin Glover. He's not done. He's not oh. done, yeah. dude. Dude, he's never done. We no. never see him get done in this movie. He just like I guess not. gets like they just stop him, but he's not done. Yeah. He's oh. still got more to do. Is Tom Green in the sequel? No. No. Because the only reason he's in this is because they were married at the they time. They were married at the time. And I think he, they, were, and they, they just dating? Or dating. Time? And he... Yeah. Was it that he had... They were definitely in a relationship at the he time. He had his cancer at the time, I'm pretty sure. Was uh, that was in the, the trivia. The... Like, he... So this was, a, like, to help things. him out, like, get some extra cash, get his name out there, and oh, have okay. him not be totally consumed by just that? Yeah. So... I... Yeah, we're, so, we're we're weirdly Tom Green fans on this podcast. I think I think the reason I like Matt LeBlanc of the characters is he arguably has the best scene in the sequel with John Cleese with the misunderstanding of like you know he's sort of talking to John Cleese as if John Cleese knows what Lucy Liu does for a living, which is being a spy. Mm. But all of the double entendres there make it sound as if she's a sex worker. Oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> and like that. And you know, he's sort of like, you know, at first I was like, I don't know about this. Is this safe? Is she in danger? But once, you know, those paychecks come in <laughs> and the women that she works with, I'm behind it. And John Cleese is looking there like terrified, but also weirdly wholesomely. John Cleese at the end is like, well, if it makes you happy, baby, you know, and he's just like, I love, I love your John Cleese, by the way. Yeah. Didn't, didn't even try to attempt just the emotion behind it is, oh, darling. you know, I'm this, Pains me, but if you if it's giving you the life that you want and deserve, well, Matt good Le- for you. Matt LeBlanc has one of the funniest scenes in this as well, where you have what you think is him talking to Lucy Liu at this cafe because we had that set up in a previous scene. So we're cutting back to that, and you're thinking, oh, is this finally where he gets to know, or he's proposing, whatever it is, and then she gets shot in the back, and the music swells, and then he's, like, grabbing her, and he's, like, screaming out, like, some other... Damn you, Salazar! Damn you, Salazar! <laughs> the camera <laughs> zooms out, and you realise he's on the movie set, and he's like, was I going over the top there? Was yeah. that too much? Yeah. And it really felt like them commenting it was, it was on the f- movie <laughs> itself. <laughs> and, and, it was and a fun-running exactly. joke. They're like, oh, he, no, he was just acting. <laughs> and then there's also, like, in the second movie, they're going to his premiere, <laughs> yeah. which is a spy sequel... <laughs> Uh-huh. And there's a they, like I think he's he's a little bit of their window into like we know what we're doing. We now. know we we wink wink. You, and it's also like it's the, he's famous from Friends for playing an actor, a, an actor who who's sort of not good. <laughs> okay. So I think it was like him just doing the, exactly the same thing. I wonder if is Matt LeBlanc okay because he failed as an actor. Like he tried to yeah. be big and he failed because he isn't very I'm, good. I would, I've watched Lost in Space. Don't you try and tell me he's I've good. also watched Lost in Space. He's not, like, you know... He's not good. He's, not he's good. okay. There's, there's... But he's handsome, so you assume, well, he should be good. Like, you know, he looks sure. like a leading man, but then it's like, but he does... What's, he is Joey. What's silly, you know... I, I mean, we can put ourselves in his shoes. Would Like, would I be where Matt Blanc is today and be like, I am, like, not still acting in a way that's significant or like you know on the mm. radar you know i'll have little bits here and there i'll yeah, get a, a series I'll, in the uk and yeah, people episodes, enjoy yeah. That and, and that's okay but like i made a fuck ton of money from that one thing i'm famous for that people like and i'm not as hated as matthew perry and i'm not so. hated about, so like would you would you would you care would you be like oh my best acting days are sort of behind me or would you be like i had a great run i can kind of you know 
Is it just weird? live off what I've done. Is it weird that the probably the most like artistically success artistically successful one from Friends is uh, is Lisa Kudrow? She just consistently kept doing what she all like good comedy and doing work roles and, that she wants, like that yeah. she's enjoyed doing. Like, I think she was, Jenna, she, she was like when she showed up in the Good Place. I'm like, yay, yeah. you're here now. You can point to Jenna and Jennifer Aniston as being the one who's like had probably the most Bigger commercial hits. success. Mm-hmm. But I think Lisa Kudrow has always played a character that she seems to enjoy being in what she's in, and she's always wonderful. But um, Angels, Bartek, did you have a favorite one? Was it based on character or the performance as well? What, what are your angel picks? Um. I mean, again, because we're so fond of uh, Cameron Diaz, it's it's hard not to say her. It's just so much fun going on. Um, but I really appreciated Lucy Liu as well. There was there, there came a point where I guess I was falling into the trappings of being like, oh yeah, she's like the the serious one who's like kind of you know snarking <laughs> through it all. Oh yeah, she's gonna do all the like you know serious stuff, all the the aggressive stuff, like the. Uh, snarky masseuse or the mm. the dominatrix like mm. inspirational person, and all of that, but yeah. then I thought back to like all of her like moments where she's just in her day to day life and like she's you know very upbeat and energetic. You know, she's trying to cook. She's worried about her relationship, and I really like that sort of. Uh, characterization. I like um, the muffin gag with her at the very beginning, yes. where yeah. <laughs> they they she brings it into the office, and Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz give each other that look, like, uh oh, we're we're in trouble now. It's like you have this character who feels like, oh, they're the most secure, but seeing them have insecurities, you know, it's compelling to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I look, Lucy Liu. I think she's my least favorite in the group, but uh, she does some underrated comedy in here. I think. As well, like, the other two get a lot of the glory shots and a lot of, like, the big moments, at least in my viewership of it, where there's, like, a lot of, like, look, it's Cameron Diaz. She gets, like, 14 dance numbers and this big kung fu thing. And Lucy gets her things to do as well. She gets some funny moments, but I just feel like she isn't as afforded them as overtly. But the I dominat- feel like the other two had more going but on. But she, yeah. she's given the big dominatrix, like, I've come into the business, Melissa McCarthy, you're a bitch and I hate you, and we're going to keep walking. <laughs> and, and you you know, she has that, where she, she breaks the thing over her knee and everyone's like, oh, Jesus. And when she was doing that, I was I was harshly reminded, oh, yeah. Yeah, Quinn Tarantino had you in Kill Bill, and you were as intense in that movie as you are here, but just the context, context is, is different. different. But like, like the performance is just as heightened, mm. just as like brutal, Ryan, why and you, over the top. Ryan, why you bring up Quentin Tarantino here? We're here to talk about Tim Curry getting her feet on his face. <laughs> Tim Curry, what was his accent? Could you tell me? <laughs> no. Do, you, do, do we need to pin it down? Is it is it not just enough in a movie like that? I love the way he said Kyoto. foreign for, foreign man. That's all we need to know. I imported it from Kyoto. What I, I don't know. I, I think I think he's supposed to be American in this. Yeah, but it's I, like clearly he's not. Like, he, he's mixed race. But, but yeah. here's the thing: he can do an American accent. I've heard it. Oh yeah. So why isn't it here? I think it's funnier. I think, I think it's think, funnier to be like, like you, hey audience, it's me, Charlie's Angels. You know this man is Tim look, Curry. There's We're the, not going to do all that much to try and hide that from you. No, and he's got his goatee. Yeah. We love goatee era Tim. And I, look, my favorite angel is, is Drew Barrymore. I, I, I always liked Drew Barrymore's angel when I was a kid. I like her now. I think she's just got so much uh, verve to her when she has that set piece where she's tied to the chair and she's got her legs up and spread and she's like talking to the guys about what she's going to do to each one of them and she even comments about okay again my light my light is not working that was a good touch that yeah. that always is what like that there clinches it for me look i love cameron diaz as well i'm a big cameron diaz fan i think she's one of the greats and i'm 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 looking forward very much to her coming back to acting but uh you know, she 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 has a lot of allure to her, but Drew Barrymore for me is is the one that uh, I just like the most, and yeah, it's just Drew Barrymore just has that on screen charisma beyond anyone else for me. I just I just believe her all the time. I'm yeah. like, yeah, like if I had to say. This isn't present here because, the well, it kind of is with Sam Rockwell, but Cameron Diaz, I mean, um, Drew Barrymore's biggest strength as an actress is having uh, believable on-screen chemistry with a, yeah. with a lead. That's why it's like, anytime she's with Adam Sandler, I'll, I'll let 
like all the Sandler isms pass because it's like they genuinely feel like they're in love every yeah. time you see them. Where to the point where I have to remind myself they're not married. They they've could never, be. They've like, never yeah, been we believe married. it. They've never been 50 married. Fifty-first dates. You're like, no, I believe. But even the wedding singer, right? But even on top, <laughs> but even on top of that, like, oh, they're not married. Like you told me about that interview she did with Tom Green, like you know, long after they were divorced, and it's like, fuck, they feel like they're still married. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She wears to Tom Drew Green. Maybe Drew is just lovely, and yeah. it's just <laughs> like that's how she connects with people. She yeah. just like everyone feels that way about yeah, Drew, yeah. and so you believe it when when they're acting with her. Uh, so what about you, Sam? If you had to pick an angel. I think this is a different answer for different parts of my life. Mm, you know, yeah. I, cool. when I, I've talked about this also kind of like with the friends, you know, mm. which is like, you're watching the friends as a kid, which did you think, you know, was the most beautiful, three incredibly beautiful, talented women mm. in friends. And as a kid, I don't know where along the lines I learned it, but somewhere as a child, I was like, Oh, blonde is beautiful. Right. So like when I was a kid watching friends, I was like, uh, Phoebe is the most beautiful because she's most consistently blonde. So I think in, in 2000, if you'd asked me, I would have probably said Cameron Diaz because she was blonde mm. and that's straight up like juvenile <laughs> me's understanding of what I'm supposed to be. I was really for. hoping the rest of your speech would just be about friends. And then the episode just becomes about yeah. friends. <laughs> a show Bardock's never watched. Uh, but, uh, I think I, I can't pick a favorite now. I, I I think Drew, ba they all genuinely do a great job for what this movie is trying to do. Mm. And mm. I think like, we all agree on that. Yeah. They're like, it's talking about like Lucy Lou. you're saying like, she's almost like the one who's a little bit more together than the others. Mm. And it's that that makes when she hasn't got it together, a little more humanizing and like, humorous and humorous. And I think all of them, have those moments where I'm like, I'm really, this one's my favorite. But then in this other scene, you know what, just how like quickly Cameron Diaz's character recovers from something. <laughs> I'm like, I really like that. Or, mm. or, or Drew, uh, Drew Barrymore, like in her flashbacks, like <laughs> if, yeah, if know, there, if there is so a much... weak link, it's not very weak. It's yeah. Exactly. Uh, I can name I you agree. the, I can name you the, le the weak link in the entire film. His name's Bill Murray. I I hate Bill Murray in this movie. This is one of the few times where I go, Bill Murray detracts from a film. Look, there's a meme stuff about Bill Murray, and that's even being challenged now because, uh, well, Bill Murray's not the nicest guy. Uh, but I never liked him in the movie when I was a kid. I like Bill. I liked Bill Murray when I was growing up. I was a big Ghostbusters fan, mm. and uh, I loved him. Like I don't like Zombieland, but he's the best part of Zombieland. Like I'm not averse to Bill Murray, but here. Never bought him. And that's where the second film was a success for me because I love Bernie Mac. I've always loved Percy Bernie Jones. Mac. I, I, I think as well, like Bill Murray can be funny. It but just he, doesn't feel like he's in on the joke like they are. I, I was almost going to say it's like he doesn't, like he's, he's, it feels like sometimes his character's designed to be the butt of the joke that he, the actor, doesn't do. Doesn't agree to. So that's like, it. That's it. It feels like he doesn't agree to it. Like Tim Curry's willing to make an ass of himself. Bernie, or Sam Ma Rockwell. Bernie Mac was there to be like, I'm going to be like the embarrassing version of the guy you just saw. I'm going to be the Bosley <laughs> who's also a secret agent, but has none of the skill <laughs> and his mother still yells at him. <laughs> And like I'm here to be. Yeah, didn't he have like family joke. issues in the second? Yeah, one? yeah. In yeah. the second one, he's like his mom's like fully yelling at him all the time, and it's like, Ma, please, I'm here with these secret agents. <laughs> See, to me, Bill Murray just this is an era of his career where he was in a slump. Yeah. Uh, like I don't know where Lost in Translation was in in relation to this. That's where things kind of picked I up again. I and feel like it's after. I think Lost in Translation's maybe when it comes to comedy. Bill Murray was on retirement at this point. It was very much Wes Anderson Bill. Murray or Sophia Coppola, Bill Murray, and then eventually he'll come back and do the things where we love what we loved and the kind of zen weird personality that he has that he did in public, like, oh, he applied for a job at an airport because why not? Yeah. And all of that crazy stuff. But at this era of his career, he was just, it feels like he's phoning it in. I just, I don't know. I just, I, I didn't find him humorous at any point. Like, I could see the glimpses of like that Bill Murray ism that makes you laugh and other things, but it just didn't feel like he was uh, fully dedicated to his own shtick here. So I was just looking at it going, what other actor could do this Bosley better? And I was just thinking about other actors, like who could do this? And instead of enjoying what was in front of me, like at no point am I thinking, 
Who could be the thin man other than Crispin Glover? No, you no one. Need, you'd, you'd, you'd never think of to, it. Yeah. There was a point where I'm going, is he really that thin? There was a moment I laughed so hard when when he does the 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 cartwheel through the locked gate, uh, and you know the gate the the gap between the two gates, and then Cameron Diaz is like, I can't fit through there. I'm like, fucking, you're kidding me, Cameron. You you can easily fit through there. Yeah. Don't you give me that but, shit. Yeah, suspension. Just like, Girls, of, lift me up. <laughs> yeah. Suspension of disbelief is if the people in the world tell you that man is thin it's like the elephant man right yeah i, I a few years and years ago decades ago uh my theater company wanted to do the elephant man and they're like oh how are we going to do the prosthetics and they they're just like you don't need to do the prosthetics if everyone looks at him like he's gross mm-hmm. than the than the audience do that's what david bowie did when he did the stage production of the elephant man all he did yeah. was physically contort his body and yeah. that was it and like, no makeup y- no hairstyle no, differences the, the, the and, he, and he's go- and he's gorgeous sell that piece. yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah, and how you sell it, and that's it. Like suspension of disbelief is a thing. This but is a same... very different conversation to what we were having before about Amanda Seyfried. <laughs> no, but that's where. Yeah, they're... but that's where they've been. Found... Fair point. But You've absolutely called us. I'm being a bit facetious, but it's yeah, funny. no, that's true. That's it's funny. I was like, oh yeah, I can believe that man is thinner than Cameron Diaz, but I cannot overlook how beautiful Amanda Seyfried is. <laughs> well, that that's movie. fine because in this movie, it's like. A part of it is Crispin Glover looks like a little freak. Yeah. So anytime they say he's a freak in this way, you believe yeah, it. You you go, go, yeah, of course. Look at him. There's that moment where when we first get the weird hair motif, you never question why this is here. You just go, of course. Yeah, because that man's... <laughs> cool. And when you read the tribute, says he came up with that. It's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> course. It's oh, even, <laughs> again, Bartek, it's even better in this sequel. It's, oh, like, they, they, when they, go in, they go into the origin of his character. <laughs> Fuck, it's so, so long. I don't remember any of that. Got, I just remember uh, Bernie Mac and his uh, mum. Oh, yeah, Crispin. And Shia LaBeouf. Oh, Shia, Shia. Oh, even he's in that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He what had, a great he had, film. What a, <laughs> <laughs> he should have done full throttle. Pink is in it. Yeah. You know, this, the, the singer, Pink, is like, it's runs... Like, it's like when you watch Zoolander, and you're like, oh, look, it's Billy Zane. Yeah. It's like, yeah, hey, it's like everyone's Just to be this, Billy Zane. Just to be hey, hey, Billy Hey, Billy Zane. Paris Hilton's here. And, yeah. And for some reason, Andy Dick. Um, but yeah, I, I want to just touch upon the actual plot of this film, Charlie's sure, Angels. if we have to. <laughs> Where it's the old bait and switch. Sam Rockwell hired... Uh, well... His partner hires them to save Sam Rockwell, but actually Sam Rockwell did all of this himself so that he could get the upper hand. And he does the, I'm the love interest for Drew Barrymore, who's kind of, I would say, the the central angel. I would say she's the mo- most yes. protagonist angel. Yeah. And uh, you are like, oh, it's the cutesy love story. She had the love thing, interest with the villain. She's yeah. literally standing in the middle. And yeah, yeah and, and all the promotional material. <laughs> that's true. And uh, I guess it's because she's the shortest. But um, uh, you know, you have the classic. She's falling in love with the villain, but it's like also how aware that you are you that that was the trope being played because they do play like the cutesy thing there as genuinely as those two thousands movies did with yeah. these fucking ham fisted romances that you have to have in there. Like it's always like you have to have it in there, okay? You have to. And it's not even say that the two actors didn't have chemistry. But it's like there's no real reason the characters need to be doing this other than this is what you do in these movies, guys. Cameron, I mean, you know, you gotta have uh Drew Barrymore sleep with this guy. Think- but then it just plays with that in the most delightful way where Sam Rockwell goes full prick. I think also like in these things, it's a very like they were also uh, as often as they could, they were trying to throw back to the mm-hmm. to the plot nature of the show. They were like, "Hey, remember how in fourteen episodes in one season, it was the person who hired them who did it?" <laughs> well, they even <laughs> like, make, they even make a joke like it's like, "Oh, and who's that woman in the footage?" Like, "Oh, she's this person." It's like, "Oh, she did it," and she appears and she's like, oh, "I heard that." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then she actually is one of the villains. Yeah, 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 yeah. She is, and she's she's a piece of work. And I looked up that actress. Yeah, just this she... this woman is not significant enough in this footage. Therefore, it's her. And it's like, and yeah, that's walks... correct. That's correct. You were right <laughs> well, there. Uh, what did you think about Sam Rockwell in this Bartek? Because when we did Moon, mm-hmm. you 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 discussed that you aren't as familiar with Rockwell's catalog of work. Like we've done a couple of things here and there, but they're drastically different each role that we've done of mm. him on the pod. So I was just curious of. Did did you even recognize him? No, I didn't. 
but he looks exactly the same like as he did in that's, Moon. That's the fact. That's the Rockwell factor. Again, talking to my wife. Just the rock She factor, was like, yeah. we watched uh, his most recent caper with Saoirse Ronan. Oh, yeah. I've been meaning to see that. It looks fun. It, it was fun. It was, you know, if I, it, if I was to compare it to similar things that, you know, movies being made... You know, Knives Out is probably the closest mm-hmm. one. It's it's no Knives Out, but it's uh it's good and it is fun and it's what you're going in there for. But like she's like I I have seen literally countless films because if you ask me to count all the films I'd have seen Sam Rockwell in, mm. I'd, I'd get lost. Yeah, and you almost always forget that he, he's that person in the film. Yeah, and like he, weirdly he often play like he's often not that far from his other performances, mm. but you lose him in the character a lot of the time. Like he's just like in three boards outside, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. He's like a racist cop. He's a racist cop. Shit. And you just think, ah, oh, yes, racist cop. And then, you know, you're like, oh yeah, that was Sam Rockwell. There's he's like, oh he, yeah, that was Sam Rockwell. He's There's Justin of... Hammer in Iron Man too. Yeah. He's like... in the MCU more than once. Here's, here's the thing that you, that boggles my mind when you have these actors. You, you look at their work and you go, okay, what did they do before this and after this? And it's like Sam Rockwell goes on to be in The Green Mile. Yeah. Like around this time. A, a and sensational he's a, performance. In the probably Mile. a career best performance yeah. next to, I would say Moon is great. Um, oh. Matchstick Men, he's basically this character but played dramatically rather than silly sure uh i'd really recommend the matchstick man that's a wonderful film uh ridley scott and uh nick cage but uh you know i love rockwell but i there was a moment when we were doing the pod where it's like oh rockwell let's talk about him and i was like oh shit that's right he was the bad guy in charlie's angels because in my brain i just remembered that guy as 2000s pretty boy that they yeah. had whatever pretty boy from the 2000s they had to do this role and then i'm like oh no it's beloved character actor Sam Sam Rockwell. Rockwell. and when he pulls out the gun and he starts dancing yeah. and he's doing all the thing and he's got his hair combed back to really let you know he's villain that but not only that he puts on the sunglasses at night yeah because <laughs> that's sexy it's a pal that's how you know there's there's a few actors you know i'm are, putting on my sunglasses now yeah please please if, do it oh no now you're too sexy i can't <laughs> i gotta you're Sam's, the bad guy sam boner is hitting the mic <laughs> i feel like i'm poker face like oh you guys don't know what i'm thinking yeah now. <laughs> if we were playing poker i would this would have worked i'd be intimidated to continue to mm-hmm. play my head he's got a full beard so it's even hard to read his mouth and now he's got glasses on. It's hard to read his eyes. You have to read his brow. Yeah. That's the real trick. Sam's actually looking at him like, okay, let's yeah, read I'm trying to emotions. study this man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Sam, like, there's a lot of people who find themselves in the leading man position who are, mm. or romantic lead position, who we can, like, say aren't what Hollywood has previously put forward as this is what an attractive man looks like, but they just sell their charisma and they just sell, like, oh, I'm cool enough or charming enough or funny enough that you will, I'll be opposite Drew Barrymore. I'll be opposite Mm. the most attractive woman at the time. And you'll be like this, these two together make sense. And then when he has to flip as the villain, his character, "Ah." you buy it because you, he, Sam Rockwell is attractive, but he also has that kind of other kind of like, look to him where you could easily see him playing a gross, creepy, yeah. like killer in say green mile. He's a, he's a guy that can, with just how he combs his hair, can really transform his look or a mustache. Like he's in galaxy quest. He's Guy Fleegman in Galaxy Quest, one of the greatest comedy films Excellent. ever made year before, like same year this movie came out. And a great like, role in that too. Like I, mm, I, I one of the best. He's, yeah, I would. Well, he's probably a fan favorite in that one. Is like, oh, my favorite character is the guy who's just an extra who somehow became <laughs> somehow gets to go on the, the conventions the, with the, everyone. The film that launched Justin Long's career. That's his first film. Oh, where Justin Long gets to play your favorite type, the nerd at home who helps the crew out because he's watched the show a lot, so he knows how it all works. So he can walkie talkie yeah, them and go, guys. So I can see this myself is... in the yeah, right? in the in the text. Like that's how I. That's that's a part of that character. Justin Long, you know, we all love Justin Long. Zach and Miri, I, wa- watch and Zach and Miri make a porno. Justin Long's fantastic in that. Truly phenomenal. His voice is insane. That's another film that we haven't done, and is mm. a film that I introduced. You know, long long time listening people will know that uh, we all went to university. Mm-hmm. We all sort of studied similar subjects at university: drama and and and, and film. Mm. 
uh, there was a film that I introduced to this group of friends that we formed called Accepted, which Justin Long is yes, in. Yes, I watched it. And I will love that movie till the day I die. I mm-hmm. think it's genuinely a phenomenal movie. And yeah. maybe that's another one I can jump that's, on. To I mean, it has, it has everything you want. Jonah Hill and and Anthony Heald. Who, Blake uh, Lively. You know, Blake Lively. Well, like, uh, star, star of Savages, Blake Lively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who had Bartek's favorite line in a movie ever, <laughs> which is Bartek. Come on. I have orgasms. He has wargasms. He's trying to fuck the war out of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a line Blake Ryan, Lively. Ryan, don't, for, don't forget Blake Lively also hosted Saturday Night Live that one time. Okay, sure. Sure. I, I'll take your word for it, but... Uh, is there anything else you want to touch upon, Bartek, with Charlie's Angels? It's, 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 the thing is, it's a movie where it's a hodgepodge of all of these different little things that run to the feature length. It's not a th- compelling piece of work, but it is what we would easily call popcorn entertainment. You you sit down, you eat some popcorn, and you go, man, I, was thinking... I had some laughs, I felt some things here and there, I, I got aroused at points, because that's also a part of the movie, let's not kid ourselves, it is a movie, it's a horn dog movie. Uh, that's... There, was, there was one scene that I had to rewind because I wasn't listening to the dialogue. What scene? <laughs> what? Is it Tim Curry getting a massage? No, it wasn't. What was it? You can admit it on the pod, <laughs> you've admitted worse. Have yeah. What's it's, it's, the worst thing you've admitted on the podcast? <laughs> that his dad has too many toilets in one house. That's really hey, we upsetting keep to me. That. No, I'm laughing oh, because why is that upsetting? <laughs> Let the man. What if he has IBS, dude? No, I'm laughing because it's not even one of the sexual things, and it involves the two kids in the film. <laughs> yeah, maybe don't admit this because <laughs> we're gonna. Yeah, no, you're we, doing, you're I admitted it wasn't a sexual thing. <laughs> this is a household full of mandatory reporters. No, no, it was. <laughs> it was the game, wasn't it? It was the fucking. Video game yes, it play. was. You yeah. fucking loser. You fucking yes. loser. Because they're, they're, it was Final Fantasy VIII. It's not a two-player game. <laughs> why Why they both got a controller? <laughs> you fucking loser. I knew it. Every time I get you two on, it's like, oh, this Game Gear from this time. Let me talk about the Game Gear or whatever it was in Surf Ninjas. You know what's and re- you, and you, you're always Mr. Did you know that this extra, that this scene, is a Final Fantasy actress that has two lines in this film, but let me talk about it for 15 years. You know and I'm what's... like... Let's talk about the actual actor in the movie. And you're like, Stephen Root? Don't care about that guy. Don't know who he hey, is. Hey, she was an actual actress in the film. And by the way, if they waited a few years, <laughs> if they waited a few years, Final Fantasy X-2 would have existed. And that game is basically could've... Charlie's Angels. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll take your word for it. So there's nothing else you want to discuss? Well, there was one other interesting thing, and this is related to, like, you know, modern day. We, we're very much in meme culture now. There was one thing in this film that, very much resembled a current meme. Have any? Oh. Have either of you guys seen the the thing of like the drive through, like person leaning over like the driver to order something? Mm-hmm. I've seen some of this. Yeah, yeah. Bas- that basically happens in this film when they're at the drive through early on. Like the the passenger side person leans over the driver to like make an order, and then the driver like looks into the camera. That basically happened with the uh, Drew Barrymore and uh, so, Lucy Cameron Lee, Diaz. I didn't notice. I thought, oh yeah, Cameron Diaz, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's almost like, oh, it's looking into the future. Wow, it's a trendsetter. Mm. This is, if I had to pair this with another film that isn't the second one, <laughs> uh, Spice World immediately jumped to mind. Mm. You watch this ah. and Spice World together you're having an amazing night. <laughs> you, you really are. Sure. This, this film only lacked aliens, but don't worry, Spice World made up for that in great abundance for some reason. So that is the only other final note I have. I just had a good time with this. I just thought it was... Uh, it was fun. It was fun. I'm, I'm sad you didn't watch it, Sam. I, you would have had a fun time no, I instead had, of sitting in your room crying I had over to, and over again. I had again to keep and, up with tradition because I, I don't know if it genuinely frustrates you or not i forgot but it's the, been like five I, years. honestly when you mentioned that i'm like was that a thing i i we're well, gonna have to take your word for I, it. I knew bartek that you, like it wouldn't be a thing for you you'd yeah. be like yeah okay sam's here sam's he much closer to ryan episode, than yeah, I, yeah but but i like everything about you ryan strikes me as like you remind me every episode of been on now make sure you watch it and then i think like well maybe... to be fair you only been on pictures power out once before yeah but before it, it was like you know the... when when we used to watch unappreciated it, when we did unappreciated masterpieces and we would watch it here in in, mm-hmm. in the recording studio you would still be like why didn't you watch this the night before? And I'm it's like, ringing no. a bell now. Yeah. Yeah. Look, so I look, was like... It, you weren't the worst offender of that. One time we had guests on for Major Pain, 
and uh, uh, they tried to phenomenal. critique flaws in the movie, and I'm like, well, that's you can't be because yeah, it's not... that's literally fixed right now in this yeah, scene yeah. because, as you see, by watching it, and there was just, I will never forget, there's never been a, co- a comment that sums up me so well, yeah. which is a very saddened reaction to... Sure, you, you sure do pay attention to things, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because I've watched Major Pain yeah. since I'm a kid. So yeah, for me, I I I intentionally don't so, yeah. don't watch it beforehand. If so, we choose a movie one day that we want you to watch and you haven't seen it, would you watch it? If I haven't, I, I, have I to, you know, like if I'd I if to, I but... if I pick like a weird film and I'm like Sam, watch this, and then you watch it, and then we don't watch it, would you be mad? No, I'd find that hilarious. Would I've, you be I, mad if, say, we told you that you have to say you love this film? Yeah, and I we, would. And I we... would be incredibly mad. <laughs> and and we... it would color the rest of my experiences on the podcast. Oh, Zathura, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, when, we you young, when you had on Zathura, we were like, Sam, you got to talk about this like you love this movie. And then Barthes and I were like, we're going to talk about it like we, we don't like this movie. If you're an, <laughs> if you're an, <laughs> avid, if you're an avid listener... Uh, but you have somehow the twentieth ever episode uh, skipped Zathura: A Space Adventure. This was also like you know in the in the past, Ryan and Bartek have been like, ah, oh, we're, we're gonna, do you want to come on for an episode? Here's something we think you like makes sense for you to do. Mm-hmm. Surf Ninjas. Hey, you recommended this movie, Sam. I thought it was actually hilarious. Come talk mm-hmm. about it. And then I think we did Zoom. I can't remember which came first. Zathura. Zathura? Zoom was much later. Zathura, Zathura was I think, was the second time we had you on. So Zathura was the second time on. And I at this point, I had listened to pretty much all of your episodes mm. at that point. And I was just like, yep, cool. It's never changed. <laughs> it's just been, we like this movie. It's phenomenal. Here are all the great things. So I was, yeah. And then you let me talk first. You were like, oh, what do you think, Sam? We're watching this scene. How good is it? And I'm like, it's great. This is the abs- Dax Shepard. Time sphincter. Why hasn't he had a bigger career? <laughs> Josh Hutchison. This is great. And then you're like, I don't care for it. <laughs> and I'm already like, I'm already four minutes into praising this movie as if it's the second coming. And you're like, I hate this to movie. Be- Bartek's like, yeah, this movie stinks. <laughs> and anyone defending it is a stupid idiot. And I'm like, I'm in too deep. To be fair, we came up with that idea like really early in the podcast. Like, oh, the 20th episode, we should do something that's actually good, but like pretend we don't like it. So it was before we picked uh, for it. Bartek, oh, I mean. So f- and it's like, again, it is funny, but in that, <laughs> when I was sitting here, in the chair going I'm in like an hour and a half that, that we don't we, we just you know movie. that was an era where we had a little bit of fun but that's over now I mean and we can, never did it again it no, just that one time just, yeah. just for you there's and a every, little treat every, just for you but I every mean, time can, I'm on they're like are they gonna, are they gonna do it again <laughs> I mean it's hard do they actually do they want to talk about Zoom yeah. like it's great <laughs> like yeah. Hideo Kojima did the trailer lie well, again man, yeah. Bartek I mean yeah we used to do that. Just that one time, it was just a fun little thing against Sam, and uh, now we don't do that. Can you bark it? I mean, it's just so odd that we just don't do that behavior anymore. When we have Sam on, we just treat him like a normal person. A normal guest. And I see what you're saying, but I wouldn't say that I bark it. No, it was just a, like a thing that we wanted to do for fun. Like I said, we came up with it right at the beginning. So what would you recommend for our next episode, Bartek? Yes. Or Bartek. <laughs> As we call you Bar- now. No, it's uh, Mr. Bartek. Mr. Bartek. Mr. Bartek. And you're master because you're not Master yet Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've not had yeah, my bar yeah, yeah, Exactly. And your pun, Sam. Hey, yeah. if it wasn't for the Starsky and Hutch film, I wouldn't know that the female equivalent of bar mitzvah is a bat mitzvah. So thank you, Vince Vaughn. I'm going to take off my sunglasses I, so I can I did know this. this. You didn't know that? No, I did. You did? Yes. From, from Starsky and so Hutch? Bright. Did that no. teach you? Uh, from your own bat mitzvah? I didn't have a bar... Uh, a bat mitzvah <laughs> or a bat mitzvah. I used to think it was bat mitzvah. I think in our um, second mystery box, the uh, Keeping Up with the Steins, I kept calling it a bat mitzvah. Yeah. Mm. But what have you got for us? What you got for so us? literally last week... It's a Christmas film. Yeah, Ryan and I were talking. Well, it's December, obviously, so we're going to have a Christmas episode. And you were saying, like, oh, I think it falls on you. And I'm like, oh, really? We did some number crunching, and yes, indeed, it did fall on, but I didn't realize that literally seven days later, I would be announcing what I'm picking for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it really caught me off guard. I'm like, oh, shit, forget the other thing I picked. Mm-hmm. Throw come, it in come the back, bin. Come back later. Um, so I have to pick a non-American Christmas film, uh, and... I don't know how much to emphasize it, but this past week has been misery trying to pick one out because of many, many issues. I can't wait for the next Christmas when this happens again. Yeah. 
<laughs> <sighs> well, based on our pattern, it'll be in two years. Oh, well, you think that, but what happens if we take a break that's a little longer and then the weeks uh, get oh, and I'll sink. pretend to be sick in a few. what if they change the calendar? What if something <laughs> massive happens and yeah. Christmas gets moved? What if something... What happens if next year is now a leap year? Yeah. yeah what yeah. if Christmas is outdated? Yeah, Christmas... Yeah. We're two years away from Christmas being abolished. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So, originally, I was like, okay, finally, we're gonna, we're gonna do a Polish film on the podcast. And for most of the week, I'm like, yes, it's gonna be this. <laughs> I could not find a download of it and subtitles, so oh, no. this is the second time I've really tried to pick a Polish film, but it's done. the personification do it. of conflict just came and curb stopped me, like, you're not fucking yeah. doing that In film. American history, x it, yeah. Yep. So I just kept thinking, like, okay, fuck Poland. Let's, <laughs> let's... <laughs> You know what, Poland? You're not going to get a movie with <laughs> subtitles that's Christmas themed for my little whoa, whoa, podcast. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Could we? Get fuck. Could, could, you fi- could you find? Fuck Poland. Could you find a dub version of the film with an English lector? <laughs> oh, Ryan, that would be way too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Can we explain what a lector is, just to sure? Say, because we've explained on the pod a lot. So in Poland, they have a method of dub. So, mm. for instance, dub when, in quotes. So when Stranger Things came out, they did a proper Polish dub where each actor is dubbed by an actor. Oh, no, no. And Poland was annoyed. They're like, we hate this. How could you do this to us? This is not what we want. Netflix, you don't understand our culture. Give us what we want. A lector. And the lector is one, usually one specific one person <laughs> doing all of the voices. <laughs> You're not far off. <laughs> Listen, keep That's listening. So stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Are they anti circusing it? Like oh, doing no, 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 the Okay, now you're off. Now you're off. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, it's usually one man. And what specific man is the famous oh. one? Like there's one guy and the the job is the English will play, but it will mute it like it will lower down in volume. Very quietly the English audio will be quiet. And you have one man very dryly with a lack of emotion in their voice tell you what is like what's being said. So this thing is happening, so it'll be like, uh, you, you're talking to me, you're talking to me, and it'll just be yeah, a I'm Polish man you. just go, Are you <laughs> <laughs> And Poland loves that. They're like, we don't want to hear yeah. any acting so like the, or yeah. emotion. So it's so like... <laughs> one man, he will do every voice and don't differentiate them. There's no differentiation. Yeah. You just have to know that from watching. So it's so someone's, out, someone's in the scene, they're like, listen, Karen, I know I messed up. Suhai, Karen. I know that... I know I did everything wrong. VM, VM. But I think <laughs> you're giving it a lot of emotion. Yeah. He said I can change. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, in, <laughs> Ryan in editing, insert the entirety of Johnny Mnemonic Lector. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very strange, specific cultural thing. So yeah. Netflix had to give them the Lector dub. So if you have a specific region, you can actually change the uh, Stranger Things, for instance, to the Polish dub, and you will hear for yourself the Lector in action. So mm. that's something to play around with at home, people. Yeah, uh, I know on, at least on yeah. American Netflix, you can change so it to Polish. Funny. On yeah. YouTube, the it's entirety the of... Thing. On YouTube, someone uploaded the entirety of Johnny Mnemonic with a Lector over it, so you can go listen to and that. And he sounds annoyed in that one. Like, like Keanu Reeves <laughs> is talking, yeah. and it sounds like he is annoyed at <gasps> annoyed Annoyed that, he, annoyed that he has to watch <laughs> yeah. this while dubbing it. So that is the that is the thing. But no, no lector English option. No, there's no. Do like... you, and audiences prefer that. Yeah. Polish they, audience love it. They prefer one mm-hmm. man monotone. As a the kid, whole thing. as a kid, there was like one or two things that I watched that had it. I'm like, this is weird, but okay. I would love to hear that. Like you know, I would love to hear why they prefer that over multiple actors yeah. and actresses. It's a trust. Promoting to I, the I thing. think there's a level of trust where you just go, this is an authority telling me the facts uh, of the okay. movie. That's how I would... Like, they're telling it to yeah, me so That's how so I would translate it as, like, if I lived in Poland and I had that thing, that would be my kind of reasoning, I would imagine, of, like, mm. it's almost like this, like... not. It's to, a familiar voice, like yeah, you were a, saying before. It's not to I be pandering, but it's kind of like when David Attenborough does a nature documentary. Like, you just trust it. You go, yeah, yeah okay. you know, that's how documentaries of this work. You just have David Attenborough sit down and tell you in the way he tells you. That's how they do it with every film. Every with, story. With one... Regardless of genre. Rarely, regardless rarely of ever scene. women. Mainly one guy in specific. So uh, what did you recommend, Barty? Yeah. Um, just to quickly go over the journey, like I just picked like different countries. Like, all right, what films do they have for Christmas here? And there was like ups and downs. Like, oh, this sounds really interesting, but this is impossible to find, you know. Good luck finding a film called Merry Christmas from Hong Kong in 1982. <laughs> that kind of thing. 
Um, I, I was like going through Netflix, like, oh, what's some like bottom of the list, like type in Christmas, what's at the very bottom? And there were some like coming soon films that sounded interesting, mm-hmm. but they just weren't coming out at the right time. There was even a Polish one that comes out on the 28th, oh, like after, after Christmas. Christmas. Two years from now, you can do that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Christmas still oh, We'll have to keep that one in mind. Um, but eventually I just went to IMDb and found like, okay, what are some international ones? And number three on the list just seemed to tick everything. Okay. Oh. And... Uh, and I managed to find it, and I have a copy that I'm going to give you, to Ryan. It is from a country called France, or at least it's a French film. I'll oh, see... as we call it, France. You lost France. me. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> well, you're not on the next episode, Sam. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> inf- Sam infamously <laughs> hates three things of movies, black and white, old, and French. Okay. I don't dislike black and white, but I do hate French movies. <laughs> do you, but do you like rebellious titles? Yes. Uh, let's hear it. Let's, let me, what do you think about a 1982 film called, this is the English titled, Santa Claus is a Stinker? I do like that, actually. I do <laughs> like that. Santa Claus is a Stinker? Yeah, okay. So okay. next week we want to do Santa Claus is a Stinker from 1982, or La Pere Noel est une ordure, or however it's pronounced. You sounded Polish when you got uh, yeah, I know. there. I thought he sounded like a Polish person trying to speak Spanish. Oh, there's a bleed over there. Yeah. We met a Spanish person got, recently who used Polish. It's got a nice, nice artistic yeah. poster, too. No, don't don't give too much stuff. away from me to me. I don't want to know too much about why Santa's a stinker. I'm going to learn about it next week. <laughs> <laughs> Last year we did Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. This time we're yeah. doing another direct Santa Claus yeah. movie. And you didn't like that one, so this is like a rebellious, like, fuck you to that title. Santa Claus. S A N T A C L A U S R A for Santa Claus. Don't, you're bringing me back nightmares of Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Hey, that song was good. Don't lie to me. So, Sam, it was a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. It's been 150 episodes. We'll meet you again in 150 to do, to do, I, I don't know, Requiem for a Dream or something well, weird. I think we said either Grind, what was the other one? Or Accepted. Yeah. If you want to do either of those. Grind is a phenomenal And, and we're going to talk it's about... terrible, yeah. but it's phenomenal. And we're only going to be positive in that film. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the thing. If you get either of those films... You can trash talk it as much. I genuinely oh, love it. Oh, come on. You can bark it's it. The, it's, the, it's, yeah. it's Zathura. It's the fact that I also didn't choose Zathura. <laughs> <laughs> I took over. Because you're like, I know you've seen this movie. And you love on. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. It gave John Favreau the, b- the ability to do Iron Man. You're going to hear it. And so if it wasn't for Zathura, True. we wouldn't have the MCU. So you know what? Thank you, Jumanji. Because yeah. if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have Zathura. Go. So in the end, we can trace back the MCU to a little-known actor called Robin Williams. It's all on him. I think... I blame him. I would think it's very funny for people to listen to this and then go back mm-hmm. and what and listen to the Zathura episode <laughs> and see if you can hear me realize that I'm <laughs> fucked, that I've been uh, fucked over for the rest hey, of the episode. If you listen, if you listen to our reviews at the end, I actually give it full marks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, that I did like, because I like, he just trash talked the whole movie. But it had Dax Shepard. Uh, and you're like, you five know five. what? Five out of five. And I was, and I, I was like, yeah, that's fine. You, you respect game when it's there. Oh yeah. <laughs> so people. Oh, by the way, I recommend uh, Charlie's Angels. I do too. And Sam recommended it for us, so we assume you recommend the film overall. You give it full marks? I do. I, I Again. Just I, like Hydro. I think you got to go into... <laughs> there are some movies you've got to go in going, I know what I'm here for. And uh, you called it a popcorn flick. It's a popcorn. It's like you're in there for some laughs, some silliness, mm-hmm. some cool... There's there's cool action in there. There's like, you know, there's they are over the top, but there's some cool stuff that happens. If you go in with that mindset, yeah, it's it's an absolute yeah, well, smash. Hit. When I was watching it yesterday, the uh, the phrase popcorn flick did flick into my mind. Um, and part of me was like, oh, am I really going to like, you know, put it down to that level? But really that is kind of... I'm here to raise yeah. that. I, 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 I'm here to raise the level of pop... Like... Yeah, Some movies it's are not out inherently, there to be masterpieces, yeah. and other movies are uh, there I mean, to distract you from your yeah, life. It's right? not inherently uh, like disparaging. Yeah, anything even to though say. This, yeah, exactly. Even though this was a, a movie that was obviously chasing for big success, there is a level to it where we look at it now, where you go, "Oh, this is like a mid-range movie, yeah. a fun thing," which they don't exist as much now. No, it's, they're, it's, they're smaller and failures. No, yeah, or they're big and 
big and dumb and blockbustery. This is discussed many times over. Even Matt Damon on uh, Hot Ones of all places had a really great breakdown of why movies don't exist like this anymore. So it's just the nature of the beast. And that's why we, we like looking at these going, hey, remember mm. Death at a Funeral? Where it was just a little comedy film that yeah. did well. It's a little budget. Uh, it had some fun actors, a good director. And, uh, you know, it just exists and we like it and we can watch and it. And there's multiple versions of that one too. Yeah, right? there's, Chris, the there's a Chris one. Rock version <laughs> yeah. uh, with, with Peter Dinklage in it as well. Peter, That's the connecting it is. thing is Peter Dinklage is in both. The Dink. Yeah, uh, the dink. We love Dinky. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> hey, and you know what? Connected back to Zathura, Elf was made by John Favreau, uh, yeah. which had Peter Dinklage in it as the boss. An undeniably good Christmas movie is Well, Elf. Uh, yeah, you can say that. I it's, did. it's, it's, it's no Fred Claus, but that's fine. Not a, you know what? It and lacks. This, this is one of the saddest things I'll ever say to you, Ryan. Not every movie can be Fred Claus. <laughs> they come, they come around once in a lifetime. <laughs> I've never seen it. Is it actually a good film or not? It's got Paul Giamatti as Santa Claus oh, okay, and Vince then. Vaughn as Sa- his, his Say dope- no more. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Vince Vaughn as his dopey dipshit brother Fred. Yeah. So you know what? Yes. Next week we're doing, was Wait. it Santa's a stinker? Santa Claus Santa is a Claus- stinker. <laughs> Don't forget the claws. You put some respect on that man's name. I hope, name. I hope that the, that is used in the film. Like somebody has to say that out loud. Just a random Englishman. Yeah. Santa Claus is yeah. a stink. I love when properties say their stupid thing out loud and they say it in that way where it's like, get it? Yeah. I'm playing Metal Gear Solid 3 right now and they give you the origins of Metal Gear and it's like, yes, and this tank with legs, it's like a DNA strand. It's almost like a Metal Gear. And then Snake is like, Metal yeah and it's like yeah, that's solid. it that's, not, that's, that's the name of it does guys. he say solid after it? Uh, yeah that's <laughs> i was really looking for that metal gear solid and then he sees Three. someone eating a snake like snake eater <laughs> oh man but that's it you can find us on social medias uh under spit and polish presents you can contact us directly at spit and polished at gmail Dot com. Let us know what you think we've talked about, or if you want to recommend movies to us, we add them to the list. At the top of the list, or at least the uh, in the top three, is your film, Sam, that you recommended of Hydrosphere, and we are waiting to do it with you, don't. so <laughs> it'll be re- there forever. <laughs> hey, Sam, you already said you don't rewatch the film, so... Come That's on. true. <laughs> Come on, Sam, true. it has Malcolm McDowell in it. I have told... So many people about this film, like, because I, I, if again, if you knew, I'm a, I teach media as as a high school teacher. So you taught this film? I have no. <laughs> what I've taught as my duty as a as a teacher and a protector of the youth, I've taught children to steer clear of that film. And you know oh, what yes. you've done? And you've they, only driven them towards because them. kids always listen to the teachers. Yeah. Yeah. don't do drugs, kids, and don't and watch, don't hydrosphere. watch <laughs> hydrosphere. That baby doesn't need to be piloting this ship. <laughs> She has to have human adult pirate <laughs> pilots. Oh my god! It has a different title on IMDb. Yeah, yeah so it does. You'd, it has different titles to trick you. Mm. It's like it's under this, and it has Malcolm. It's one of those movies where it's a, it, it's a pyro. It, yeah. it, it pretends to be a real movie. Like, look, it's got an actor you know. Yeah, that means it's a real movie. Look, it's got John Travolta or. Bruce Willis or yeah. Willem Dafoe or like these actors hey, that they this, do these movies and worst, you're like, oh, I'll watch it. The, the worst possible way you could spend your time, we've tricked you with one actor that you maybe like. And they're in it for five minutes. They're in it for such a short amount of time. Or they die or they, yeah, yeah. It, what we're and saying, yet what we're saying, like prominently on the cover. What, <laughs> look, the what we're saying is do not watch Gareth Edwards' Godzilla. Brian Cranston is not in the movie that long and they tricked you and they misled you and it's not worth it. Okay. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Bye. <laughs> so do you recommend friends? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Sure. There's, you know, I personally think that, you know, Final Fantasy nine was already out at the time. So they should have had that in the film, but I will concede at the that... time of recording or at the time of release. Well, I, th- well, I think that was like 1999, right? Look, look, here's the thing. If, if they at least had a poster of it in the film, that would have made a little bit, like, we could Easier. have believed that they're playing this yeah. while waiting for the next I, But one. again, I will concede that the card game in 8 is phenomenal. Triple triad, definitely. Oh. You got a good close-up on Squall, too. That was nice. The I, I noticed it was blurry, but I think Quistus was the other party member there. I think she would have been more appropriate to focus on in, like, a Charlie's Angel film, right? Sure.
Sure. <laughs> what, what, what you, can you expand on that? No. I just, <laughs> yeah. Why, yeah. Please, sure. please, Bartek, let me leave. <laughs> no, I think. Yeah, they they played a video game. It wasn't right. I agree with you, Bartek. They did it. They did it wrong. Mr. Bartek is a stinker. Yeah, yeah he's a stink. That's. I'm gonna make a, a Polish Christmas movie and call it Mr. Bartek is a stinker. And you have to get a lector. Lector. Yeah. You have to get a lector. Which will be Bartek. <laughs> <laughs> he, he won't know it's a film about him until he steps into the booth. So that's what you wanted to record all that stuff for. Yeah. And it's a movie about loving Zathura. Geez, as well. Sam, thanks for paying me to come in and record some stuff. That's oh. Oh, shit, it's all making fun of me. Okay. Ryan, what's something esoteric that you mentioned this episode that you can quickly give a review of? Uh, Tim Curry's goatee is very stylish in this. I, w- I wanted to kiss it, honestly. Did so you want to put your I... feet on it? Feet, fingers, and another... <laughs> 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 I don't know why that got him. Now I can bark that. Yeah. You can bark that? 